Yes, what a blessing that song is. I stand amazed. That's one of my favorite songs. This week I've been singing this song of the verse. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we might be called. Uh, behold, I may not be able to say it without singing. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. Uh, what's the rest of the verse? Uh, that we might be called the sons of God. And so I'm so thankful. What an amazing thought that we might be called sons of God. And uh, behold, at what manner of love I've stand amazed. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews to the 10th chapter. If you would, join me in standing. It is certainly a blessing to have the Demarists with us uh, today. And uh, Brother Demarest, uh, some of you don't know this, some of you, many of you do, but his Uncle Jeff and Aunt Robin to my brother and sister and I. And uh, for those that don't know, my dad, when he was in high school and his parents uh, uh, divorced and went through a difficult time, my dad and his twin sister, my Aunt Edie, uh, moved in with the Demarists. And uh, brother, brother Jeff was like a brother to my dad. And so, um, and, uh, so we've known them our whole lives and um, they're very thankful for the Demarests. And we were talking a little bit about uh, Brother Jeff's uh, Demarest dad yesterday, Brother Carlos Demarest. What an amazing uh, testimony uh, he had and um, thankful for the opportunity to know the Demarest. Hebrews chapter 10, I'll not say more because I have a lot of verses to read and so we'll get directly to it. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll begin in verse number 1, and I think it's important that we have an entire, a, a, a good picture of this entire, not the entire chapter, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but down through verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast made no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering uh, uh, for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, where, uh, which are uh, offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's an important verse to the message. By the which will, this will, that God's will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From whence, I'm sorry, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 14 again. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my, my, my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw nigh, I'm sorry, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience 
and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful and promised. Uh, that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Our text verses are 18 through verse 20. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. And this morning we're going to preach on this. The veil that is his flesh. The veil of his flesh. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love. Lord, we, when we consider, behold, what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we might be called the sons of God. Lord, uh, we stand amazed when we think about what you've done for us, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to be the veil, that we can enter in into your holy place, that we can, have, uh, we can boldly enter before your presence, that we have uh, 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 your presence and we have uh, uh, perfection and peace uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your son, Jesus Christ, that we can come before your presence. What a, a glorious thing that is. Uh, I'm thankful for that. I pray that you'd give me unction from on high, power from on high. Lord, I want to preach your word. I don't want to preach my ideas or my thoughts. Lord, I pray that you'd help me proclaim your word with boldness, with power this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We see here this morning in verse number one, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. And so the, the, what he's referring to that, that, uh, that, that makes the, or that is the shadow, is the, the, uh, the tabernacle, or later on the temple, where uh, in the law that God gave to man that we might have an opportunity, first of all, to come before the presence of God. Now, uh, without giving, going into a long detail, we understand, hopefully you understand that you went into the outer courts of the tabernacle or the temple, and then after that you would go into the, the, the court or you would go into the holy place, and then beyond that there was a veil. Uh, a curtain that hung and be, when you would go beyond that curtain, beyond that veil, you went into what it, they called the Holy of Holies. It was not just, uh, 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 it was not a casual place that you, go, you would go into. In fact, uh, when you go back to the law, you would find that the, only the high priest could go in. And the, whole, the high priest could only go in one time a year. And he would go in for a specific purpose to sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, on the Ark of God. And the, the veil that, that separated the, the holy place from the holy of holies was, a, was symbolic. It wasn't just symbolic, it was, it was purposeful at the time, but symbolic as well as we read here. It was a, a shadow of things to come, of what was meant uh, uh, to, to be planned from the beginning. And so we see that this veil between what was a divider between God and man. And the veil between us, it was first of all, the, the, uh, 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 it was a veil between us and the presence of God. See, the Holy of Holies, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the mercy seat represented God's presence. And they weren't supposed to come just casually before the presence. Listen, and this is important, we'll get to this. They were not to come boldly in before the presence of God. They didn't have the right or the privilege. There was only one that could come. It was only the high priest. And he could only come in at a certain time. And he had to make sure that he went through all of the rituals that were necessary so that he, and, and, and to be cleansed, to be sanctified, so that when he went into the Holy of Holies, he was clean and pure. And as he went in, he was before the presence of God. They would even tie pomegranates or sew in pomegranates and bells at the bottom uh, of his robe and have a rope tied around his leg. And that they would hear, they, no one else was allowed beyond that veil, beyond that curtain. And if he was not sanctified, he would fall over dead. 
the bells would stop and they would pull his body out, literally from the Holy of Holies. And so it, it, this was not a, a place that was uh, 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 some, something to a, a, uh, enter into casually. It was a holy place. It was the presence of God. And, and we just mentioned, I'm ahead of myself, the veil is the division between us and the presence of God. The veil is the division between us and, listen, the perfection of God. That there was not allowed any sin or, or uh, any uh, 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 impurities into the holy of holies. I just mentioned about the high priest and, and that he had to do everything to the letter of the law before he was allowed to go in. And if something was undone, he, he would literally die. If someone touched the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, they would die. There is uh, such a, a division uh, uh, between us and the perfection of God. We know that we're all sinners. You and I are, are, are sinners. You and I, uh, every one of us, uh, the, the, the best of us are all sinners. None of us could attain the perfection, the glory of God. None of us have the ability to stand before God in our, in our flesh and say, I have the, the right, the ability, I have the boldness to come before God in my flesh. None of us have that ability. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. And so uh, that veil is a picture, is a, is a shadow of, uh, it, it helps us understand that the division between us and the perfection, when I say perfection, I'm talking about the, the sanctification, the, the, the holiness of God. And we'll talk about perfection in a different way in a moment. It's a division between us and the presence of God, and the perfection of God. And can I say this? The veil is a division between us and the peace of God. The, uh, take, take your Bibles very quickly, and this is just part of the introduction. Go, go over to Romans chapter 8. Verse number 6 says, For to be carnally minded, carnally is of the flesh. Uh, um, having a mind of the flesh, to be carnally minded, and, and even more than that, to, to not be of the Spirit, to not have accepted Christ as our Savior, to, to be given the power of the Spirit, to overcome the, the carnal mind. And we can, we can go into that further in this chapter. We won't take time to do that right this minute. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is, listen, is life and peace. When we, are, when we accept Christ as our Savior and we're given the, the Holy Spirit to, to guide us and lead us and we're, we're in the Spirit, we have life and peace. We're spiritually minded. There's life and peace. You say, what do you need peace for? Now, again, I'm not talking about peace uh, uh, as in some kind of peace treaty uh, or in, uh, you know, where uh, uh, the Miss America would stand and say, I want peace in the world. That's not, what I, that's not the type of peace we're talking about. Look at verse number seven. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And when I say that the veil is the division between us and the peace of God, can I say that in our, carn our carnality, in our flesh, we cannot have peace with God. We can't be at peace with God in, in, in our flesh. We cannot be at peace with God in, in, our, in our carnal body. It's not possible. Our, 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 our carnal body, our flesh, our carnal mind is an enemy. It's at enmity. It's at war with God. And there's never a time in our flesh or in our, in our carnal mind where there's a, a declaration of peace. Put down your arms. No, uh, forever our mind, our carnally mind is at war, as at enmity with God. You say, well, how, could we have, uh, how can we have peace? Well, in this uh, Romans chapter 8, and we'll get to Hebrews chapter 10 in a minute, it, it, it's, it's only through, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's only through Jesus Christ where we can have the peace. And that veil uh, 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 is, is, uh, is uh, uh, exemplary of the, 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 uh, the inability of our, us to have peace with God. We can't get to God to have His presence. We can't get to God because of His perfection. We can't have that peace. There's a veil forever between us and God. And, and we know that there's not a, a veil right now. In fact, 
when Jesus died on the cross, we could take our Bibles and turn to the book of Mark. And, and well, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three uh, uh, talk about this. But Mark chapter 15, verse 38, that says, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, uh, the, the veil was rent in twain. No need for a veil anymore. No need for the holy of holies. Jesus Christ, listen, as we look at our, our passage, verse number 20, by a new and living way which, we, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And when Jesus Christ came and uh, was born uh, of a virgin and, and, and lived a sinless, perfect life, never sinned, there, in him is the, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells and there's no need for him to, to die and uh, there's, there's no separation between him and the holiness of God. Uh, when I say that for all have sinned and come, the short of, uh, come short of the glory of God, that's you and that's me, but that's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is holy and perfect. You say, well, why did he die then? He died because he took your sins and my sins on him. But he didn't just die. And we've talked about this over the last several weeks many times. And this is not a series or anything. It's just the Bible goes together well, doesn't it? That in his resurrection, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. We'll get to that in a moment. And when he overcame death, hell, and the grave, uh, he gave us the ability to come before the presence of God. Now... One, at one time there was a veil between man and God and only one time a year could the high priest go into the presence of God, the perfection of God, the peace of God, only one time a year. But now, Jesus Christ, having died on the cross, being the sacrifice himself, he is the veil. Can I say this? You cannot get to God without Jesus Christ. You must go through the only veil you must go through, Jesus Christ. I can't stand before God and, and I can't stand before God's presence in my flesh. I can't stand uh, before uh, God and, and have peace. Uh, there's enmity between me and God. I can't stand uh, before God in, uh, in, in perfection without Jesus Christ. In my flesh, there's no way to come. I have no, I have no ability to approach the presence of God without Jesus Christ. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior June 13th, uh, uh, sorry, June 13th, you've heard that date before, July 3rd, <laughs> I've heard it so many times I feel like it's my testimony, July 3rd, 1993, June 13th, 1971, you've heard that testimony many times, July 3rd, 1993, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior at 929 Big Bend Road, I was able to come before the presence of God, not on my own account, not in my own works, for by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I, I, didn't come, I can't come to God in my own works. I'm amazed at the grace that God allows us. I, 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 what, behold, what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we might be called the sons of God. We can be allowed in the presence of God. We can allow in the perfe in the, into the perfection of God. We can be allowed uh, to have peace with God. Because of Jesus Christ. Now as we continue in this passage, as we look, and we're thankful, but no doubt, for the veil that is Jesus Christ that allows us into the presence of God. Verse number 18, now where remission of sin, uh, re remission or payment or forgiveness uh, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. There's no more there's no need for an additional sacrifice. And that's what these verses that we read before said. There's, there's no need for, for a veil. There's no need for a, another sacrifice because Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice once for all. He sat down. And it's a, I love this verse. Look what it says. Uh, uh, um, verse number, uh, back verse number 10. By the which will, he's talking about the will of God. By the which will we are sanctified cleansed, purified, holy through the offering of the blood, uh, the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. He, he, he died on the cross. He said, it is finished. He was buried in the grave. Three days later, he arose never to offer a sacrifice again. A sacrifice is not necessary. Once for all, sitting at the right hand, the, the priests came every year. The priests would do daily uh, sacrifices outside the Holy of Holies. And Jesus Christ gave the perfect sacrifice once. Amen. Never to be needed again. Sitting down at the right hand of the Father. What does that mean then? Having therefore, brethren, boldness, verse number 19... Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. So because of these things, having therefore a, a, a boldness to enter into the, holy, uh, the, holy, uh, the holiest, uh, holiest by the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near. And there's three let us's over the next several verses that I'd like to preach on this morning. Because we have the opportunity, the privilege to come before his presence, to come before his perfection, to come be that have peace in God. There's three let us's and I'd like to preach on those this morning because of the veil of the flesh. Because we have a perfect sacrifice as we see uh, verse number 14, by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Number one, because we have a perfect sacrifice, let us draw near. Let us draw near. The Bible says here to come boldly uh, as if uh, uh, without fear, without intrepidation, without uh, uh, a concern uh, that we'll be accepted. We come boldly before his throne. In the shadow of things to come, when the high priest was what brought us to God. The, not to say the plan wasn't perfect, but the imperfection was in the men. Imagine, if you would, that your, the day that you lived, if you lived, if you were a Hebrew and you lived uh, in uh, Israel or Judah, and to come before the presence of God. No, you couldn't come before the, the, the Holy of Holies. Imagine if your priest was Eli or Hophni and Phinehas. Imagine if your priest was Eliashib. Remember when we preached on, on Nehemiah and Eliashib, he gave his son to marry the daughter of Sanballat. Imagine if your priest was Urijah, the priest under Ahaz. Imagine if your priest, much like this pastor, was flawed, was a sinner. The challenge to come before God, listen, boldly would be difficult. There's, there's a sinner in the way. And here we see when, when we get to verse number 18, it says, Now where remission of these, there is no more offering of sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. And when we talk about boldness, it's, it's, it's almost like a freedom. I don't, I don't have anything. I don't have any dread. I don't have any concern. I'm not worried about anything. I can come boldly before his presence, before his throne. We, have, we are so blessed we ought to be so grateful for that privilege to come boldly before his throne. Imagine if you were one that, again, that you had a, 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 a pure heart before God. You wanted to live for God and you came to the temple and your priest was Hophni and Phinehas. Imagine the challenges. Imagine the year that it was time for you to bring your sacrifice before the temple and you knew that that Eliashib was the priest. Or Urijah was the priest. And you say, well, I just don't think I'll come this year. I'm tentative. 
I'm not so sure about going before the presence of God. But can I tell you, we have A in verse number uh, uh, 19. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And I can say that because of Jesus Christ, the veil of Jesus Christ, I can come boldly before his throne. There's no worry. There's no concern. There's a, there's a, a freedom and a boldness to come before his throne. And because of that, let us draw near. In this perfection, we have assurance. Look what it says. Verse number 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. I don't have to worry. Brother Abraham, I don't have to come on my knees in prayer and say, God, will you please accept me? Will you please accept the work that I've done this, this week? I, I've tried to be good this week. I've, I've tried to do everything that you wanted me to. I've tried to I, don't, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to, to, to stay away from the, the prayer closet and coming before his throne because I'm a sinner. I already know I'm a sinner, but I can know that I can come boldly before his throne because I'm not coming through the veil of my flesh. I'm coming through the veil of Jesus Christ. <laughs> What a glorious idea. What a glorious thought. I can have assurance. I'm not going to be turned away and kicked out. <laughs> I don't deserve to be there. I don't deserve to be in his presence and neither do you. But when I come in the name of Jesus Christ, when I come saying, I, I have claimed the blood of Jesus Christ, the only ability that I have to be before you is because on July 3rd, 1993, I accepted Jesus Christ and the blood covers me and now I'm saved. I know that I have acceptance in your presence because of his blood, nothing that I've done. I can come boldly. I can come in the assurance. How many would say that's exciting? How many would say, I failed this week coming boldly before his presence on a daily basis? You don't have to raise your hands. Oh, what sadness. That we can come before his presence with boldness because of the, the veil that is the, 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 the flesh of Jesus Christ. And yet, we don't draw near. We, we, we don't come before his presence boldly. I've heard my dad say a number of times, and I think he got it from, from uh, Brother Keene, Brother, Brother Charles Keene. He said that, that uh, often we don't pray because we're uncomfortable in the presence of God. Well, you're a sinner. You know. I'm a sinner. And I've lived in the flesh, and I walk in the flesh, and I think, I don't need to be in God's presence. I'm, I'm a sinner. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to, and I'm not saying don't worry about being a sinner. Don't worry about sin. We'll take, talk about that in a moment. But there's no worries. You can come boldly before his own, even though you are a sinner, because you're coming through the veil of Jesus Christ that is his flesh. We can have assurance. In this perfection, there is cleansing. Oh, how thankful I am for that. We could turn the book of 1 John chapter 1 and we could see that, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can stand before the presence of God boldly. Let us draw near. Because there's cleansing in His presence. Those sins that, that, that thus so easily beset us can be wiped away, can be forgiven, can be atoned. If we will, but we need to come before, look what it says, verse number 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We're clean before the presence of God. And then let, look at verse number 23. We said, because we have a perfect sacrifice, let us draw near. Secondly, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised because we have a perfect sacrifice let us hold fast when it says to hold fast it's to hold firm and when we talks about this it's talking talking about their profession of faith meaning the work of faith you know that you and i were not saved to do nothing 
We're, we're not saved to uh, uh, lie dormant. What a, what a sad thing it is when you see a Christian that receives the blessings of God, receives the goodness of God, receives salvation, receives, and never returns those goodnesses to Him. Never works. You say, Pastor, you said that you don't have to work, that your works mean nothing. Oh, sure, certainly. We, we, <laughs> there's none of my works are, are, are worthy to get me into the presence of God, but once I'm in the presence of God, I ought to be so thankful and grateful because now I'm made worthy. Now I should be a worker. Let us hold fast the profession, the work of our faith. Because we're good? No. Look, look what it says. Take your Bibles and turn back a few pages to the, the, the final chapter of the, uh, of the uh, uh, first uh, letter to the church of Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Would have probably been easier to say the first Corinthians 15. It'd been faster rather than saying the final chapter of the first letter to the church at Corinth. It's, I said final. It's the second to final anyway. It's the, it's the 15th. It's not the last one. Uh, anyway. Verse uh, 55. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Now, this is uh, really talking about much of what. Hebrews chapter 10 is talking about in regard to having the freedom of, uh, of, uh, of uh, power over death and hell and the grave. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Hey, you don't have to worry about death. You and I, if we've accepted Christ as our, our Savior, what's the, what's the pain or the sting of death? O grave, where is thy, uh, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The only reason that, that death is painful and harmful is because of sin. Oh, death, uh, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can say, praise the Lord. Uh, behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. We can say, I stand amazed. And this chapter could stop right there, and that would be it. And we could uh, be very grateful and very thankful that Jesus Christ gave us power over death, hell, and the grave. But it continues. It says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as, you, as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I, I uh, work and I labor not to earn salvation, but because I've been given salvation. Because I have power over death, hell, and the grave that was given to me, the victory through Jesus Christ, I need to stay, uh, 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 hold, uh, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, what the Lord wants us to do. Turn back to verse number 23 of Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Well, there's many that, that uh, uh, begin a work, that they, they get into the, 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 uh, the work, they accept Christ as their Savior, and they, they grab a hold of the work of, uh, of the profession of faith. But Brother Alex, they let go. We, we, we stop working. I'm not saying that I, I'm saved once for all. I'm saved forever because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But because of that, because He is faithful, I should continue in the profession of faith. Stop. Let's, let's not put that down. Uh, uh, the, the, the statement I've heard many, many times, we weren't saved to sit, soak, and sour. How many have ever heard that one? We don't accept Christ to be done. And because we have the privilege to, to come before His throne boldly, because we have the privilege, then we must hold fast the profession of our faith, the work of our faith. And then thirdly, we mentioned, because we have a perfect sacrifice, let us draw near. Because we have a perfect sacrifice, let us hold fast. And thirdly, because we have a perfect sacrifice, let us consider one another. Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love 
and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Notice it says this, let us consider one another to provoke unto love. Now I believe that's talking about to provoke unto love of others. That they will love others. Can I tell you that that's one of the responsibilities that I have as a pastor? To provoke you, to push you, to give a... In fact, that's one of the reasons we're meeting today. That's one of the reasons we'll meet tonight and we'll meet on Wednesday night and the next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Wednesday night uh, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together so that we can exhort, so that we can provoke one another to love. In physics, if you have an object at rest, there's a certain amount of force that is necessary to keep an object moving. In fact, uh, um, an object that is at rest tends to want to be at rest. An object that is in movement tends to want to stay moving. Do you know that it, if you pushed a, an object at a certain force, you could keep it going, but it may not move it from standing still? There is a force, physicists call it, a force of friction. And an object that is at rest, let's say we're going to push this table across the carpet, uh, there's a certain amount of energy that we would need to keep it moving, but there is a certain amount more that is necessary to get it out of its stagnant or stable position. You'll need more, and you know this, this is not difficult. If, if we were even a car that on a flat surface, if it's in neutral, you'll need more energy to get it started than you would to keep it moving. That's the, the there's, a, there's a, without getting into the science of it, not that I understand it at all, but there's a coefficient of friction and you have to, to figure out what the energy you need and the, the newtons and so forth, the, the energy, that you, the, the work that's necessary, the, the energy that's necessary to do work. Anyway, all that I don't even like to talk about. But what I'm saying is there is a force of friction that you must overcome to get the object moving. Maybe some of us need someone to provoke, to push, for us to begin to be obedient to the Lord. And you say, well, I, I, the, the love of God it just motivates me to keep going. And I hope it does. But some of us need a little bit of this. Provoking. To get us moving to be obedient to the Lord and to love others. See, Brother Dover, if I can come boldly before the throne, there's nothing special about me, then my neighbor can as well. Brother Smith, my co-workers can come boldly before the throne as well. Brother Abraham, my, my family members can come boldly before the throne as well. And I should be a conduit of God's love. If I can come boldly before his throne, if I can come before the, the presence of God through the veil of his flesh, then others can too. And some of us need a little bit of this sometimes to provoke us unto love, to tell someone else that they can come before the presence of God as well. That they can, that they can enter into God's presence, that they can that be, uh, come boldly, that, that they can come before, uh, through the veil of Jesus Christ. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Many times a, a Christian becomes stagnant, stops working, stops serving the Lord, stops living for Him. And that's why we have church to kind of give a little provoking. And it's not just the, the pulpit, by the way. Brother Gates, you can be a blessing to Brother Smith and, and to help provoke him. And Brother Hewitt, you can be a blessing to Brother Edwards and so forth and so on. We can, we can provoke the love and say, listen, if... if Brother Harris can teach a Sunday school class. Surely I can teach a Sunday school class. Give Brother Harris a hard time. Hey, if, if they can work on a bus route, I can work on a bus I can, I can serve the Lord. I can be obedient to reach others. If that person can witness and, and bring people to Christ and can do the good works that, that 
uh, Christ came to, to give us, to, to, to follow after. If that person can do it, then I can do it. And, and we need to continue. Let us provoke one another Amen. unto love and good works. And that's what it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, uh, together. Not, not missing the, the time where we have where, where it's not just the pastor that's provoking, but it's the church members that are provoking one another to love and to good works. And it says, but exhorting one another. That's not just the pastor exhorting, but that's everyone exhorting one another. And so much more as the day approaches. You say, what day? Well, I believe what it's talking about is the day in um, verse number 13. From henceforth expecting or un, uh, uh, until that day, till his enemies be made his footstool. Until that day is here, and as that day approaches, and I believe it's coming sooner than later. Until that day, we need to continue to provoke. We need to continue to exhort. We need to continue to, to, to push one another to be obedient to the Lord. We need more of it because it's, you, you, you're not going to get it from turning on the TV. You're not going to get it from opening the newspaper or looking on the internet. And so because we have a perfect sacrifice, because you and I can come boldly before the throne, because we can come before the presence of God. We can come before the veil that is his flesh. Because of that, let us consider one another. So I stand here and ask you, have you approached the Holy, have you approached his presence? Have you approached this peace? Are you still living in enmity with God? Carnally minded, walking in the flesh and not after the spirit, and having not accepted, not walking, not walked through the veil of the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? Let me say it in a different way. Are you still unsaved? Are you still attempting to come before the presence of God in your own works? Are you still coming, getting on your knees and saying, God, I've tried to do this this week, and I've tried to do this this week, and I've tried to do this week. Will you please accept me? Are, are, are you still trying to come by your own power, or have you surrendered? Have you given up? Ha have you repented and say, I don't want to do any, I don't want to come any other way, but I'm claiming the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross, that he paid for my sins, and that it's only him, by him, that I have access to your throne. I told you it was July 3rd, 1993, when I gave everything up and I said, it's Jesus Christ and I'm accepting Jesus Christ. And now I can be called the Son of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. What day did you do that? Do you remember the day? Say, so, Pastor, I've always, I've just always been saved. I've always been going to church. Do you remember the day? September 23rd, 1980. There was a day I was born. I didn't just always float around out there in history. There was a day when I was born. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. A specific day where your spiritual life began. You were born. I've always just been going to church. Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you come before the presence of God say, there's no way I can come before his presence but through Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Are you boldly approaching the presence of God? Say, Pastor, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. How about the, your prayer life this last week? Have you boldly approached the throne of God this week? We have the privilege to come before the veil that is to say, his flesh. Before, the, through the, the sacrifice, the, the perfect sacrifice that is Jesus Christ, to, to, without any uh, uh, intimidation, without any uh, uh, enmity, without any struggles because of Jesus Christ. And yet, have we boldly approached? Have you boldly approached the presence of God this week? Are you holding fast the profession of your faith? Do you struggle to continue to, to serve him and love him and, and to follow him? 
Are you provoking others to love and to good works? Well, it's, it's wonderful to say, to, to, and I'm thankful for the song, Brother Harris, it's wonderful to say, uh, um, I stand amazed. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But what are we doing with that opportunity that we have to come before the veil that is his flesh? Are you taking advantage of that opportunity? Are you coming boldly? Are you uh, uh, holding fast the profession? Are you provoking others? I'm going to ask you to have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Say, Pastor, the message that you preached this morning is for me in that I've never asked Jesus Christ to save me. I've never been born again. I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'd like you to pray for me. Pray for me this morning because I've never accepted Christ as my Savior. I don't, I've never come before His presence to the veil that is to say His flesh, through the cross of Christ. I've never done that. Pastor, will you pray for me? Anyone like that, raise your hands. Pray for me. I've never become, I'm not saved. I've not been born again. How many would say, Pastor, I have come boldly before His throne in that I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I've been born again. I can tell you the day that I was born again. I may not remember the date, but I can go back in my mind to the very moment where I accepted Christ as my Savior. That's me. I'll raise my hand. That's me. Pastor, that's me. I'll raise my hand. I remember that. Thank you. Put your hands down. If you can't remember a day, listen, I, 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 there was a day when I was born, and I, I know that I'm born because of that day. If you can't remember the day, you better check to see if you are saved. I would say that if you don't remember accepting Christ as your Savior, you're probably not saved. Today needs to be the day of salvation. If that's you this morning and you weren't sure to raise your hand, at the invitation time, come down the aisle. Take me by the hand. We'd love to take someone, to have someone show you from the Word of God how that you can be born again, how that you can accept Christ as your Savior, that you can be called the Son of God. Pastor, I'm exce- uh, 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 I've saved, I know, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, I've been born again, but one of these other three areas that you mentioned, whether it's coming boldly before His throne, or, or holding fast the profession of my faith, or... Uh, um, uh, um, Provoking others to love and to good works. I struggle in one of those areas. Pastor, pray for me. I'll raise my hand. Pastor, pray for me. I struggle in one of those areas. The invitation is for you. Come down to this. Uh, come down the aisle to this altar. Tell the Lord. Ask the Lord for His help and His power, His strength to, to do that. To come boldly before His throne. To hold fast the profession of faith. To provoke others unto love and good works. I'm going to pray. Then we'll stand to our feet, head bowed and eyes closed. The invitation will begin. You have the opportunity to come forward. If you want somebody to pray with you, just uh, look up at me and I'll have somebody to pray with you. Father in heaven, bless the invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Stand to our feet. The piano begins to play. Brother Edwards begins to sing. The altar is available. Come every soul.